alhamdulillahi assalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome everybody from around the world. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim and this is the BAK show where we discuss things which are important to you. Um, we uh, try our best to answer your questions, take your comments and your concerns so that um, everybody can stay up to date. We are broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Twitter and uh, YouTube. We're not on Facebook um, because, you know, the, the Facebook platform is not um, very uh, friendly to us. We have <laughs> hundreds of thousands of followers, but um, our posts don't reach our followers. Um, we'll post things um, and it'll show up on maybe 65, 70 timelines and that's it. So um, we don't expect a lot from the people at, uh, at, at Facebook. So it's pretty much a dead platform for us. Now, um, we are in the 29th night of Ramadan. And uh, just to let everybody know, um, we will have our uh, OGN website uh, back up and ready to go uh, somewhere in the next week or two, inshallah, um, where we're going to be uh, having a, a podcast. Um, it's going to be uh, a daily podcast. We're going to where we're going to basically be continuing what we've been doing here in the month of Ramadan. Um, so we'll be giving you details and such like that and all because this is important, guys. You know, we really it's it's imperative that people stay up to date, um, know what's going on and where it's happening, because one of the tools that the enemies of Islam use in order to be able to um, uh, keep the people subjugated is to control the flow of information. Um, if they can keep you convinced that every Muslim fighter is a terrorist, because when you go on TV, everybody's saying Muslim fighter terrorist, Muslim fighter terrorist, Muslim fighter terrorist. So then you start in the beginning, you're like, no, 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 they're just against this land. Muslim fighter terrorist, Muslim fighter terrorist. And then after that pounding for so long and there being no voices um, insisting in the opposite direction and giving you information about why these people are attacking, what's their beef, what is the situation, you could start to think that your own Muslim brothers and sisters are nothing more than just terrorists. It's getting a bit hot in here, so I'm going to take this off. Um, that you would think that your own Muslim brothers and sisters who want freedom and are fighting for freedom um, are terrorists. Uh, it's, it, it happens all the time. So uh, it's very important that Muslim media stays active because when it stops being active, then the support for Muslim causes significantly goes down. Just look at Afghanistan. Afghanistan after the, the attacks of September 11th, and I've got my own theories about what happened on September 11th. Maybe some people won't like those theories. But um, uh, there was a big push. A lot of people don't remember that just before September 11th happened, there was a big media push that was talking about the drought that was going on in, um, in Afghanistan. All of a sudden, the, uh, uh, all of these aid organizations are so concerned about Afghanistan and how the Taliban are um, using their resources for weapons instead of trying to feed their people and everything. All of that was going on the months before September 11th, when Mullah Muhammad Omar, may Allah have mercy on him, ordered the destruction of uh, one of the uh, 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 statues that were worshipped there in Afghanistan. Um, that was a, a huge story. And um, th they said, this is a heritage site and this is a war crime. How is this possible? And, all, and this was the rhetoric that was going on in Afghanistan before September 11th. Because in my opinion, there were preparations being made. And then September 11th happened. Taliban were demonized. Osama bin Laden had already been demonized. And it made it easy 
for the uh, uh, for the enemies of Islam to win the media war, at least initially. Same thing when it came to Iraq. I am no fan of Saddam Hussein. I'm being honest with you. I do not like. I do not like Saddam Hussein. And the more that I read about him, the less that I do like him. But he did say the Shahada before he died, and therefore I accept the fact that he died as a Muslim. And that's as far as I will take it. Um, however, I'm not going to charge Saddam Hussein with some stuff that he really wasn't connected to. George Bush said to his cabinet, which was confirmed, where he said, can we connect Saddam Hussein to uh, Al-Qaeda? Now, anybody who knows Saddam Hussein realized Saddam Hussein was not a religious person. He was an enemy to a Sunni, Shia, and any uh, uh, Kurds, anybody who was a threat to his rule, he was an enemy. He was not this uh, great figure that some of the Arab countries, like here in Syria in some places, try to make him out to be um, this great Arab hero. And if Saddam was here today, things would be different. Um, nah, man, a lot of the people, they don't know Saddam Hussein, but the United States built up this whole thing on weapons of mass destruction and Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein were in cahoots with each other. Because remember, the invasion was in 2003, the second one. And this was uh, the run up to it. And that was just two years after September 11th happened. So when you have all of these media wars that are going on and the Muslims are just sitting there going like this, and they're just looking back and forth and they're like, yo, I don't know what to believe. And who do I go to? Do I go to CNN? Who do you think CNN is gonna back? Do I go to Fox News, ABC, CBS? Because our uh, too many of our Muslim platforms are struggling and therefore people don't know where to go. But Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, we are um, moving forward and with the advent of social media, things have progressed to some level. But we want to become less dependent on these social media platforms because just as Facebook basically shut us down, um, that can happen to any uh, dissenting voice um, from these platforms, particularly because a lot of these platforms are Israeli friendly. Now, when Elon Musk, um, you know, he took a trip out there to uh, Israel, he was a guest of Benjamin Netanyahu, and then some of his rhetoric changed when he came back. But so we don't want to be dependent on these platforms. Um, we are today, but we don't want to be tomorrow, and the movement's got to be towards improvement. Okay, listen guys, um, we're here today, this 29th night of Ramadan, to answer your questions pertaining to Syria, uh, uh, Gaza, West Bank, uh, wherever there are Muslims and there are questions that you have and we're able to answer them, then we're going to try our best uh, to, to, uh, uh, to do that. So you can send in your questions, your comments, your concerns. This is a family show. So yeah, as long as it's all good, we're going to read it out on live. We got A-A-T-A, -A -A. Salam from Toronto. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Akhil Kareem. Good to have you, man. Oh, we got Moyen here, and he's saying, Assalamu alaikum, watching from Falls Church, Virginia. That's, that's back home, man. That's back home. Um, that huge masjid that was there, um, I forgot the actual name of the masjid, but it was a big, it was a big masjid there, not too far from the, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., um, right in Virginia. I think it's right in Falls Church. Uh, I was there so, uh, quite a few times. Is that masjid still there? Uh, how are things there? If you get a chance, maybe you can send us a, a response and, and, and all before we go off. We got HB in the house who says, Salaamu Alaikum. May Allah accept all your efforts, brother. Ameen, ameen. Ya Rabbul Alameen. Wa yakum, wa yakum, wa yakum. Um, uh, let's take a look and see what Murtada Ahi says. Tuning in from Ireland, mashallah. What do you think of Bimbaz's fatwa allowing military, excuse me, personnel in uh, Arabia and the events around Saddam which took place? 
Um, I never agreed with that fatwa. Um, I will tell you that I have a lot of love and respect for Sheikh Ibn Baz. May Allah have mercy on him. And I'm not one of the people who say that you'll take a person who lived a life of piety and uh, and service to the Muslim Ummah, and then they make a fatwa that you don't agree with, and all of a sudden you just kind of dismiss his life's work. Uh, yeah, I'm not really from those people. Um, I think that uh, Sheikh Ibn Baz, may Allah have mercy on him, did a a mountain of good of good deeds, good work, uh, fatawa that benefited the ummah. And I think if people went back and reviewed his fatawa, they would benefit and be in, in better shape today than they currently are. But after having said that, um, I believe that uh, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Allah um, was deceived by the Saudi, the Saudi government at that time. The information, you see, the other man will tell you that you will get an answer based upon the question that you ask. You will get an answer based upon the question that you ask. So, for example, um, he was given the information that Saddam Hussein was gearing up to invade Saudi Arabia. So, therefore, uh, he always considered uh, Saddam Hussein to be a kafir, a non-Muslim. And therefore, his logic was that he is using another kafir, meaning America, to get rid of another kafir, which is Saddam Hussein, because he believed that Saddam's coming in or invading and uh, uh, invading uh, Saudi Arabia was imminent. It wasn't imminent. I believe that he was tricked and that was the reason why he gave the fatwa that he gave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But whether he was tricked or he wasn't, I didn't agree with it up until this day. But the, my level of love and respect for Sheikh Ibn Baz, may Allah have mercy on him, um, remains high. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay. Oh yeah, Moyen came back and he said, yes, Darul Hidra. That's right, man, Darul Hidra, mashallah, mashallah. Um, all right, German forces in the house and says, Salaamu Alaikum Bilal, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. How does Hamas manage to get new weapons supply despite being cornered on land, air, and sea? Please share your view. Um, they get smuggled in, um, just like every siege, even when we were in the siege of Aleppo, some things were smuggled in. Um, uh, uh, we here in northern Syria, uh, in Syria in general, um, after all of these years of civil war, uh, are accustomed to sieges and we understand how they work. Um, it really gives rise to smugglers and smuggler routes. So yes, um, th those routes are there, they're open, and um, but it's not something that um, you can always rely on because routes which are open on Monday could be closed on Tuesday. And that's just the nature of these uh, uh, smugglers routes. So yes, it does happen uh, and all, but bringing in enough to take care of an entire population is another matter entirely. Um, we've got peace now who says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah grants khair and afiyah. Ameen. Ameen. Uh, I, I really appreciate the duas. Really, this is the 29th night of Ramadan. It is possible this could be Laylatul Qadr. Um, some ulama think that it's said the 27th, but we all know to look for it in one of the odd nights um, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And this is one of those. So who knows, you know, keep the du'as coming. Do you think uh, Al-Jolani, this is coming from Catherine Elwan, do you think Al-Jolani will kill more people who worked with Al-Qahtani? Um,
I don't, I, I, I don't, can't answer that question. I'll tell you why. I don't think that Abu Muhammad Jolani is a bloodthirsty killer. Listen to what I'm getting ready to say here, brothers and sisters. I don't think that Abu Muhammad Jolani is a bloodthirsty killer who kills just because, for whatever. I don't think he's like that. That hasn't been the experience that I have known from him. He's a killer because he wants power. He wants influence. And he wants the people to be afraid of him. After what happened to Abu Maria Kohtani, um, his followers will have a choice to make. Will they seek revenge from uh, Abu Muhammad Jolani or will they join Abu Muhammad Jolani or will they just simply walk away? These are the choices that are in front of them. Now, if they decide to join Jolani, Jolani won't be trying to kill anybody. If they decide to just say, forget it, I'm walking away, I'm done with all of this, Muhammad Jolani, I don't think he's going to go after them. But if they try to seek revenge, then I think that you'll see more targeted killings. That's just how he is. That's how gangsters are. So a lot of gangsters are not bloodthirsty killers, even though they kill a lot of people. That's not their main goal. Their main goal is not like... Um, uh, 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 you know, one of those serial killers that they need to kill just to feel good. No, they're after a certain thing. They're after money. They're after power. They're after territory. If you don't get in their way, you ain't got no problem with them. You might actually think that they're pretty nice people until you decide to say, hey, wait a minute now. You know, this ain't, this ain't gonna work. And he's like, oh yeah, really? And then you see he'll switch up on you. And that's the reality of the situation. So no, uh, I, I can't say. Allah knows best. We'll have to see what Qahtani's people um, are actually going to do. Um, is the U.S. strike, uh, this is uh, Aulia uh, Karim Pohan, who says, is the U.S. strike in Yemen having any effect on the Houthis? <laughs> no. You see, Yemen is something, it's a lot like Afghanistan in the respect that it is not a, it, 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 is, it is not a, territory which is, um, how, how can I say, airstrike friendly. What does that mean? When you go to places like Iraq, it's got these big cities, these big, the, 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 all of these big structures. You've got the people uh, uh, gathering in all of these, uh, 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 population centers, um, lines of communication, lines of, <clears throat> of, of supplies and such like that and all. It's easy to attack those places like that. But in places like Yemen and Afghanistan, they're not airstrike friendly. In other words, everything is really spread out and in so many different locations. And groups like the Houthis, groups like the Taliban, understand how to not put all of their assets into one thing. So you gotta understand something. The Houthis are not a traditional military. Groups which are not a traditional military give big powers like Russia, big powers like the US, big trouble because they don't fight like a regular army. They don't go head to head, tank to tank. What they'll do is when these two are coming, one will pull back and allow you to come in and draw you in. And once you're in, they launch a guerrilla warfare against you. Now, for the Houthis, things have changed dramatically because we're in the age of drone warfare. So you can take um, a, a, a Houthi lot that as long as they have a place for their small drones carrying explosives to take off, um, you've got yourself a resistance. And that's big trouble for places like the United States of America because they're accustomed to fighting militaries straight up and down. So when they get to, uh, if they're going to attack 
um, uh, another country. They go after the military assets. They blow up the homes of the of the uh, military commanders and such like that. That's how America knows how to do it. But when you've got these fighters that are coming out of caves or they're in the desert somewhere, what are they doing? Um, we don't know where these drones are coming from because just today there were seven, I'm sorry, five drone attacks from the Houthis on ships that they believe were friendly to the Israelis, both civilian and military. That's today, okay? So just because you're not hearing a lot of that in the news, don't think that the Houthis have slowed down or stopped because they haven't. Um, so that's ongoing. So I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, that the Houthis and groups like them, um, like the Taliban, are the US and the UK and India's worst nightmare because they don't fight a traditional fight. All right, let's take a look and see. Um, what should happen to Turkey uh, so that they can have better stability with the economy? Erdogan is too old and there are hungry wolves all around. It feels dangerous and uncertain. Listen, I, that's an easy question. I'm going to tell you something. And then I know some people are going to say, yeah, and some people are going to say, ah, oh, they're going to do that. Look. Somebody asked me on last night's show, um, what advice do you have to raise the iman of a person who's living in the West? How can he um, uh, 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 move forward as a Muslim? Something along those lines. And I said to him, I said, the biggest and best thing that you can do is to read and commit yourself to the Quran. Okay? All right. Um, and I'm going to say this to you. Look, guys, if I was talking to Rajiv Tayyip Erdogan right now, and he's in front of me, and I'm talking to Abdul Fattah Sisi, and he's right in front of me, and I'm talking to Tamim from Qatar, and he's right in front of me, and Nahyan, and he's right in front of me, and, 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 and I would say to all of them the exact same thing. Guys, you want your legacy to live on? You want to be the greatest ruler your country has ever had? You're not going to get it by being slick, by getting into the riba game and, you know what I'm saying, and the central bank is doing some whoop de doo Guys, it's not going to get that. You're not going to get it like that. It's not going to work that way. When you commit to doing the things that the Quran asks you to do, you do. The things that the Quran forbids you from doing, you abstain from it. That's when you're going to be the greatest rulers of your time. I'm saying to you because the game of politics and warfare and such like that is not designed for you to win except that he gives you the win. It's not there because you win because you're the smartest or because you have the biggest military, or because you have the most money. Because we've seen countless examples throughout history wherein there are people who have big militaries and big money and they got their butts kicked. So is that right or not? The reality of the situation is that the victory comes from him and him only. But people are playing games and they keep thinking that it's gonna come if they ally with America, or if they ally with the enemies of Islam in Britain, and then, after they've been the leader for five or 10 or 15 years, they just sit on the bed and they say to their wife, I don't know what to do. I tried everything. I gave it my best shot. But the reality, girl, I don't know, man. I wish, I wish we never would have took this gig. I wish we never would have killed our predecessor so we could be in power because this gig is a drag. That's the reality. I mean, look at Bashar al-Assad, president of the country, a big time loser or nothing, a zero or nobody. If you look at Abdul Fattah Sisi, he's nothing but a poodle for other, uh, for, for other countries. Didn't lift a finger to help the people in Gaza. How great do you actually believe that Egypt is going to be when they have to get their victory from the one whom they left their uh, 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 
ibad. They left Allah's servants to rot in Rafah and to be killed and to be starved. How great do you think Abdul Fattah Sisi's rule is going to be? So that's what I would say to all of them. Uh, and Allah knows best. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Catherine Alwan asks a question. She says, how much longer do you think the war will continue in this region around Syria? Um, until we take the advice that I just gave in the previous question, sis, um, um, I'm going to tell you. And I told a lot of the commanders here, and I'm saying, guys, if you really want, I said, look, if, if you want to just be a, a commander, you can rule over a couple of cities, a couple of villages. The enemies of Islam will give you that. You know what I'm saying? You have some girls, some money, and you can do some things that other people can't do. But you ain't never going to have nothing. But if you decide at some point that you say, I'm going to give these people justice, even if it's against myself, now you're talking business. Now you're talking about making real change. Ah, but making a few changes here, a few changes there. Joe Lanny's talking about there's going to be some elections for sure, council. You think you're fooling the people. You think you're fooling Allah. And all of these cosmetic changes, it hasn't slowed down the protests against him, not one bit. Why? Because the victory comes from Allah. It doesn't come from any other, any other source. So if you understand that, why are you looking for victim doing the haram things like Reba, like allying yourself with the enemies of Islam? Why do you think that victory is going to come from, from that source? Why don't you call the people who are fighting for your brothers and sisters what they are, heroes, instead of trying to fit in and then saying, yes, what Hamas did on October 7th was a war crime, but let me finish my statement because I am a pundit and I want followers and such like that. That's what so many people did. They had no business to tell people that Hamas, who had been under occupation for years, a siege for 17, 16 years, and then they launch an attack and they lash out and they take prisoners that were occupiers. These prisoners were not people that they went or to Russia, or to Poland, or to Afghanistan to go and get. No, they took them from people who were living in lands that didn't belong to them. They were accessories to crimes. Now, the way that Israelis will try to frame it is they'll say, no, but wait a minute. These people didn't steal these, th th this land. Their government stole the land, and the government sold it to them. Okay, cool, bet. I, I get that. So let me ask you a question. How about if I go to known people <clears throat> who steal cars, why? Because I want me a car and I know I can get it on the cheap. So I go to them <clears throat> and then I say, yo, check this out. I want me a car. They say, yo, can I bill out what, what, what you want? So man, you know what? I'm gonna get me a Ferrari. And he says, okay, I can get it for you. Come back in two weeks. I come back in two weeks and he says, okay, give me $25,000 for a brand new Ferrari. And I give him $25,000. And then I end up getting stopped by the police. The police sit there and say, where'd you get this car from? And I say, oh, I got it from so-and-so. And he said, oh yeah, those guys, they're all thieves over there. How much did you pay for it? $25,000. I'm going to jail. Why? Because you can't get a Ferrari a brand new Ferrari for $25,000 unless it's stolen. So they'll take me to prison. I can't stand there and say, hey, I paid good money for this car. I didn't steal it. Is anybody going to accept that? Is a judge going to accept that? Absolutely, positively not. They're going to say, you had full knowledge that this Ferrari had to be stolen and therefore you participated in the crime 10 years in prison for car theft. Now, we want to change that up when it comes to uh, 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 these uh, uh, Israelis because they say, oh, look, she's just an old grandmother. And oh, well, what was she doing in, uh, in uh, uh, occupying stolen land? Oh, but look, 
No, she's just a lady. She was just trying to take care of her kids. Well, how come she didn't take care of her kids in land that wasn't stolen? Well, they look at another and say, but look, but what about the kids? They kidnapped the kids and all. Okay, as all, if you look at the accounts of Hamas, Hamas has not tortured the, uh, the detainees. They haven't beaten them. They haven't uh, 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 done anything. They've given them the best of food, which is what Islam uh, uh, demands. And they said to them, don't be afraid. We're not going to harm you. But what they want is for them to leave their land. And that, in my opinion, is extremely muhtaram or respectable. A German force comes back and says, so you mean Israel is aware of the smuggling and act like they don't know <coughs> Or are, are they just incapable of tracking? No, uh, you have to understand that the siege is not complete around Gaza by way of the Israelis. A big part of the siege are, uh, is, is coming from Egypt. On almost all of the, on three sides, you've got the Israelis, but on one side, you've got Egypt. And there were many, many tunnels where um, all kinds of items were smuggled into Egypt, I'm sorry, uh, into uh, the Gaza Strip. So um, it's not from the direction of the Israelis, but from the direction of the tunnels uh, in Egypt. And that was big smuggler money. So um, yeah, and that was, so it was a vibrant trade route. Okay, Mwayan says here that uh, Dar al Hijra uh, is now going to build a new community center in Central uh, Centralville, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Wow, I remember those days. I remember those days. All right. Um, uh, Salman the Light says, how do you think the resistance in Gaza is surviving without food and water? Um, like the rest of the population is surviving uh, on, on just the bare basics. That's how I think. I don't think that the resistance is any different from the rest of the population. HB says, uh, we all see that the leaders of the Muslims are the problem. What should Muslims do to fight against them without causing bloodshed and chaos like we saw as aftermath of the Arab Spring. All right, look, I'm gonna give it to you straight. Some people are gonna to wanna to switch off now. And I get that. But I have to be honest with you. Um, the change is not going to come without bloodshed. Now, does that mean that we need to go out and shed blood? It doesn't mean that. But I'm gonna tell you that we shouldn't be naive and think that all we have to do is say to Abdul Fattah Sisi, for example, listen, Abdul Fattah, these are Muslims. They worship Allah. You know Allah, don't you? Yeah, sure you do. Okay, now these are people that they just wanna live. And you know what? It's not good to maintain a siege helping the Jewish state of Israel. That, that, that's not so good. So how about we do this? You lift the siege, repent to Allah, and everything's going to be okay. What do you say, huh? And then he'll just sit there and he'll agree. Yeah, that would be nice if that happened, but I wouldn't count on it. But what I would count on is that as soon as you sit down with him and then you say, hey, lift the siege and all, he's going to call up Tel Aviv and say, yo, I got some people coming over here telling me to lift the siege and everything. I need, I need more backup. I need more money. I need more of this or more of that to make sure that I can protect your interests because it's within the Israeli interest to maintain the siege and the blockade. Even if you're not going to assist the, uh, 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 the resistance, at least don't help Israel to maintain the siege. That's the reality of the situation. So I would say don't assume at all that we're going to take back our lands without bloodshed. It's not going to be, it's not realistic. But that doesn't mean that we want bloodshed. But I just want to make sure that you understand 
that a lot of these leaders are directly working for the enemies of Islam. So it's not about just convincing them. Their personal interests actually lie with helping the enemies of Islam and helping them to destroy the, the, the affairs of the Muslims. So when you have people like that, it's just like a saying that I bought um, a couple of days ago, um, wherein somebody said, it's hard work convincing a man of a concept whose salary depends on his not understanding it. In other words, the, some of these leaders are only in place because they do the things that the enemies of Islam want them to do. And when they stop doing that, then they understand that they get thrown to the wolves and they don't want to get thrown to the wolves. So they do what the enemies of Islam want them to do. Now you think it's because there's not enough dawah, that um, there needs to be more sheikhs, there needs to be um, more letters written and stuff like that. Man, they know all that stuff already. They, not, they clued up on that. But their personal interests do not lie with helping the Muslims. That's the reality. So I do think that we need to resist, but it has to be a smart resistance. I'm talking about you know, um, different modes of resistance of civil disobedience, but being prepared that the day is gonna come when you're gonna have to fight. I'm gonna say this again. Civil disobedience to help the people in the military who are average people to understand, don't back these people. What we want is Islam. What we want is good for the Ummah. We don't want to see another Gaza. Don't help these people. Now, after having said that, you don't want to go out there and just start attacking other Muslims, shooting them, shedding their blood. I mean, some of them are kind of just doing their jobs, which is bad in and of itself. But you want to try your best to bring in as many people as you can to weaken the enemies of Islam as much as you possibly can. So there should be a good dawah campaign, a good political campaign, and leaders um, who are um, who, who speak out against the injustices. But be prepared, because nine times out of ten, the regime will resist. Try your best if you are militarily not able to stand up to the state military in which 99% you're not gonna be able to do, don't get into a physical confrontation. Civil disobedience would be a very effective tool because what the regime will want you to do is to get into a military conflict knowing that you can't win. So you fight your battles on a ground that on a ground that you can be successful. Civil disobedience um, is is one of them. Boycotting um, a certain institutions, um, uh, doing a, a, a public walkout, wherein people will literally just say, "I'm not going to work today," and you will find that it will paralyze the major cities. Now people say, "Okay, but that's going to harm the other people." Guys, you want your country back or you don't? Then there's got to be some sacrifices that are gonna be made here. So that's some things that everybody can participate uh, can participate in. A boycott of going to work. I got a government job or I've got uh, a private sector job, I'm not going. People who own shops in major, in, in major shopping centers, shop is closed today. I'm in solidarity. I want there to be change, and I'm not going to accept anybody telling me that I can't, so uh, that I can't have it. These types of things, and there are many, many, many different types of things that can be done that we could discuss at a later date. Now, all right, we are going to um, wrap this thing up. Um, oh, we got Zoe Ryan here, um, who's got a good question. Um, advice to raise pious children. Three things. This is just from, from, from me. One, instill the love of the Quran in these kids. You know, um, help them to understand that the answers to their problems are in the Quran. One. Two, do your best not to lie. 
not to cheat, not to steal. When I say, you know, not to lie first and foremost, because lies can flow right off the tongue easily. Cheating and stealing is a different thing, but all three are bad. But don't let your children see you doing these things. And the best way for them not to see you doing these things is for you to abstain from them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you say something to them, they'll listen. They'll be willing. They'll say, okay, you know what? I didn't know my father to be a liar. I didn't know my mother to be a liar. And I knew that they were an upstanding person, even though I didn't always agree with them. And therefore, you'll have the respect of your children. So instill love of the Quran. Be a good, good example for your children. And thirdly, make sure that you help the children to understand who the heroes are. Don't let them go to public schools and to think that all of the heroes are non-Muslims, just like they'll see on TV. Martin Luther King, in my opinion, he was a person in the worldly life who was a hero. But when I see that it's just Martin Luther King uh, 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 and other uh, non-Muslim figures, I could develop the idea that there are no Muslim heroes. And there are. There are a lot of them. So help them to understand and to know such and such a figure, Salahuddin Ayyubi, was a hero to the Muslims. He had difficulties, but he fought past them and he delivered big gains to the Ummah. And then you'll take uh, other people um, whom I believe was a hero, Mullah Muhammad Omar from Afghanistan. May Allah have mercy on him. He stood in the face of the uh, um, uh, oppression of the United States of America and um, and refused to turn out Osama bin Laden because he said he said that um, that uh, Osama bin Laden is a guest here in the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. We do not allow him to carry out those those types of attacks. And if you have proof, bring it to us. That proof was never bought. And that is big time respectable. And Muhammad, Mullah Muhammad Omar is a hero of mine. I ask Allah to have mercy on him because he wasn't just saying, look, um, I, I, I'll protect Osama bin Laden, whether he's correct or he's not correct. I'm just going to protect him. That's not what he was saying. He was saying as the leader of Afghanistan, we don't allow people like that to pull off those kinds of attacks from our land. And I believe him because he wasn't a liar. The other thing is, is that he and he's saying, if you've got proof on him, bring us that proof and then we can deal with the situation. But I'm just going to turn Muslims over to non-Muslims. Why? Because you got uh, 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 because you've got a military. OK, well, we got fighters, too. OK, yours is bigger than mine, but I'm afraid of Allah and I'm not going to give him to you unless you give me a reason why I should now. The leaders that we have today, they would just say, <laughs> okay, well, where you want me to drop them off at? That's exactly why it is. And that's why they don't have anything. That's why they have no honor. That's why they have no true power. Because if you look at the Gulf states, for example, they have trillions of dollars in, um, in uh, oil and gas wealth, trillions of dollars. But they wield no military power unless they're going after um, uh, uh, other Muslims like the uh, Emiratis and the Saudis attacking the Yemen, uh, uh, the, 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 the poor people in Yemen. Or you have the Emiratis bankrolling Hameti and his Janjaweed uh, uh, RSF uh, fighting force um, uh, uh, raping and killing the Sudanese, which doesn't necessarily mean that I'm back in Burhan. But I'm just telling you what the, where the Emiratis are at. So I'm saying is that they are these big monsters who are like this when it comes to attacking other Muslims. But you let the U.S., U.K., or anybody sit there and say, hey, man, you know what? That person that you got over there, we don't like him. Why don't you send him to us? They say, all right, well, when you coming to get him? They have no honor. And Mullah Muhammad Omar did, and Allah knows best. So teach them who the heroes are. Um, um, 
German forces back and says, Erdogan often said interest is the mother of all evil and he tried to fight it, but why wasn't he successful? Wasn't this the right way? Yeah, sometimes people will be going in a certain direction and they themselves won't get there, but they pass the baton to someone else who will carry it um, a, a bit further. Um, I don't agree with everything that uh, uh, the Turkish president says and he does, but I think that he's better than almost all of those other leaders that are out there. Again, it doesn't mean that I endorse every decision that he makes because I don't, but I do believe that there's some good in there for um, and Gira, as we would say, uh, 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 for Islam inside of his chest. I believe that. And once again, doesn't mean I agree with everything he says he does, but I do think that there's that there's something in there that I don't think is in there for Mohammed bin Salman, and I don't think it's in there for the Nahyan family. And Allah know, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um uh, let's see, we're gonna wrap this thing up. Um Okay. All right, we are going to wrap this thing up now. All right, Alan Watts, this is gonna be the last one. And he says, Gaza will never be liberated as long as Saudi, UAE, Egypt, and Jordan countries are myths because they are the ultimate hypocrite who are hell bent on undermining every jihad effort. Ain't it the truth, brother? Ain't it the truth? And that's real. Um, look, let me give it to you straight, brothers and sisters. The Houthis, as we mentioned earlier in the show, are attacking ships that are trying to get into the Red Sea up to the Suez Canal. Now, lo and behold, who controls the Suez Canal? Oh, wait a minute, that's Egypt. How come Egypt doesn't shut down the Suez Canal to ships going into Haifa, into occupied Palestine? Why don't they do that? To know, maybe that's not a priority for them. So you've got this little uh, ragtag army called the Houthis who are making it difficult for Israeli bound to and fro uh, uh, ships um, uh, coming into the Red Sea. And that's something that Egypt should have been doing, should have shut down the Suez Canal um, uh, to those ships, but they didn't do that. The Houthis uh, are, are the ones causing those types of problems and helping their brothers and sisters in Gaza. Now, we also have to look at it, is that who's helping the state of Israel who consumes 50% um, of, the, of the food that's consumed in Israel is imported. 50% is imported. That means that without supply lines, then, then, then the prices are gonna skyrocket in Tel Aviv. That's real. But who said, hey, guys, Israelis, my friends, I know how we can get around those pesky little hoofy guys. We can do land routes, huh? Land routes. Now, what am I talking about? There is an Israeli company called TruckNet, an Israeli company called TruckNet, who the ships, instead of risking going around the Cape of Good Hope, around Africa, trying to get past the Houthis, what they do is the ships then come to the ports in Bahrain, the Bahrains, which are a part of the coalition fighting against the Muslims, uh, uh, trying to help other Muslims, uh, meaning the Houthis, uh, trying to stop the ships from going to Israel. The ships go into the ports of Bahrain and they go into the ports of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the United Arab Emirates. And there are fleets of trucks from this Israeli company called TruckNet that ferry the goods from the ports of Bahrain and, and uh, the United Arab Emirates into Saudi Arabian territory into territory of Jordan and then into the, the, the Israeli uh, a port city of Haifa. 
And this is happening by the direct participation of the Saudi, Jordanian, Bahraini, and Emirati governments. You can go online, check it for yourself, type in TruckNet, um, and you will find the information. Um, and that's the reality of the situation. So yes, they are hell-bent on stopping any Islamic uh, 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 nishat or movement. Uh, they're very, very keen to make sure that anything Islamic fails miserably because they understand if there was Islamic justice, they would be the first to go. Well, that's it for today, brothers and sisters. My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. Um, inshallah ta'ala, if tomorrow night is the first of Ramadan, uh, 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 the first of Ramadan, uh, the first of Shawwal and, and all, we're going to be here to congratulate you on the completion of Ramadan. If not, if not, then it'll be the 30th night of Ramadan. So in any case, bi'ibnilayhi ta'ala, we're going to be right here. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu